Hey everybody, welcome to Red May. My name is Kyle, one of the organizers for the event. We are a month long red arts and red politics lecture series that uh, is based out of Seattle, Washington. We are remote again this year, but uh, looking forward to um, being in person again next year, hopefully. Um, a couple of quick updates before we get to our very exciting panel for today. Uh, this weekend, we have a few more events um, as we round out our month uh, of events. Everything is archived on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you're listening right now, you are on it, uh, youtube.com slash redmaytv. You can look at all of the past uh, lectures and talks that we've had from this year and previous years. Um, so tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m., uh, we have Spectre Presents Ukraine, Imperialism, and the World Economy. This is all Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and that's going to be our last scheduled event at the moment. Uh, if you're local in Seattle, you can come to the Beacon Cinema with us at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday uh, to watch Electra, My Love. Um, also, before we get started here, I just wanted to let you all know that um, if you like what you hear and you are a fan of our work, there are a couple of ways that you can support us that's super helpful in order to get money to sustain our work and also to buy tickets, uh, plane tickets, hopefully for an in-person event next year. Uh, so if you'd like to do a one-time donation, we have a GoFundMe page. Uh, and all of this is linked in the description box in the YouTube video as well. Uh, and we also have a Patreon account where you can make a sustaining donation of a few dollars a month. Um, this also helps support uh, year-round content through our podcast, Cinderblock. Uh, with that, um, I am going to stop talking now and bring on the rest of our panelists um, who will uh, begin this, this wonderful talk. So um, enjoy. Okay, hi, um, my name is Saran, and um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher based in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, and uh, I have written a book called Mute Compulsion, which will be out later this year in November uh, with Verso Books, uh, and I'm going to say a couple of things about that in a moment. I'm Sam Chambers. I teach political theory and political economy at Johns Hopkins University. And um, I've written a bunch of books and I'm gonna try to talk about some of them in a way that speaks to uh, Soren's book and the project of, the, of this conversation and panel. I'm Cordelia. I'm, I'm co-host of Real Abstractions with Edward. Uh, I'm currently working on a book and some other work at the intersection of social epistemology and value theory um, in, in both senses. Uh, and I'm going to hand it off to Edward now. Yeah, I'm Edward Edward. Um, I'm also a co-host of, of Real Abstractions, uh, sometimes podcaster. Um, I'm also objectively the dumbest person here, but I'm really excited to, to, to talk to some of you guys about, about, about your work and, and get into this stuff because I find it really interesting, even if it's not officially my work. So. Okay, uh, is it is it my turn now? Okay. Um, all right. So I will, as I said, I will try to uh, say a couple of things about my forthcoming book. Uh, I will try to summarize the most important ideas, and I will talk for about twenty minutes. Um, the title of the book, "Mute Compulsion," is taken from a passage in the first volume of Capital. Uh, and in the English Penguin edition of Capital, it's translated as silent compulsion. Uh, but I think that mute is a more accurate translation of the German word stumme. Um, Marx only uses this expression once in his writings, as far as I know. So it's not like this is a keyword or a, a central concept or, an, or expression. Um, nevertheless, I think that it, it, it expresses an idea which can be found in many of Marx's writings and which has not been given the attention that it deserves. Namely, that the capitalist mode of production relies on an anonymous, abstract, and impersonal form of power, or what Marx calls the mute compulsion of economic relations. 
Um, if one is familiar with Marx's critique of political economy and, and uh, trends in Marx's theory in the last couple of decades, uh, one will know that this is far from a controversial or an original idea. Marx is very clear about this and his descriptions of the impersonal and abstract power of capital are well known. Um, there are lots of Marxist scholars who have emphasized this, for example, Michael Heinrich, uh, Moshe Pastone, Ingo Elbe, Robert Kurz, Ellen Mikesens Wood, William Clare Roberts, uh, just to give some examples. And I, so I, I draw a lot on these authors in my book, um, so I don't claim to have discovered anything new about Marxist writings or about cap uh, capitalism. However, despite the quite common acknowledgement of the existence of economic power, I think that there was still a need for a, a systematic theory of mute compulsion, which is what I try to do in my book, try to construct in my book. So the book presents a theory, uh, a set of concepts developed on a high level of abstraction, where I'm only concerned with uh, what Marx calls the ideal cross-section of capitalism. So that's what, what belongs to the essence of capitalism, regardless of its uh, various historical and geographical variations. And I developed this theory by means of a critical reconstruction of Marx's thoughts on power, drawing on most of his writings and combining it with insights from all kinds of Marxist as well as non-Marxist research. And uh, the book is divided into three parts. The first part is called Conditions and examines the concepts of power and capital, as well as the, uh, as well as the ontological conditions of possibility of economic power. In other words, this part of, part of the book asks, how is it possible for human beings to entangle their collective life form in something like economic power? And answering this question uh, involves an analysis of human nature and the specifically human relationship to the rest of nature. The second part of the book is called Relations and examines one of the two main sources of economic power, the relations of production. Uh, I first examine the specifically capitalist form of class domination and why this results in an anonymous and abstract form of domination. And uh, I then go on to discuss how the power of capital relies on and reproduces oppression based on gender and racialization. And finally, I discuss the horizontal relation between units of production, um, that is, market relations. And uh, the, most con uh, in, the, the important concepts here are value and competition. The third and final part of the book is called Dynamics and examines the second main source of the economic power of capital. Uh, the dynamics, which are at the same time a result of capitalist relations of production and a cause of these very same relations. Uh, so these dynamics include real subsumption of labor and nature, the creation of a relative surplus population and economic crises. Uh, and in this part of the book, I also examine two examples of capitalist dynamics, which have greatly strengthened the economic power of capital throughout the 20th century. Uh, first, the so-called logistics revolution in the last 50 years, and second, the globalization of industrialized agriculture in the 20th century. Um, the book is, in a certain sense, an attempt to contribute to answering the question of why capitalism still exists. Uh, we live in a time of crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, climate crisis, health crisis, unrest, social uh, uprisings, pandemics, and so on. Uh, so despite an extremely turbulent decade, uh, capital has managed not only to hold on to its power, but also to expand and fortify it. Uh, so we live in an era of capitalist expansion uh, amidst crisis and unrest, and my book begins from the question, how is that possible? Why hasn't capitalism collapsed yet? Uh, how do we account for the power of capital? Uh, and most attempts to answer this question rely on an assumption about the nature of power, namely that it has two fundamental forms, violence and ideology. Um, the reproduction of capitalist Social relation is then understood as the result of a combination of the ability of the ruling classes to employ violence and their ability to shape how we perceive and understand ourselves and uh, our world. I, and, and, and I agree that capitalism is uh, completely unthinkable without the constant presence of ideology and violence, but I think that there's more to the power of capital than that. Mute compulsion um, or economic power is a third form of power which cannot be reduced to neither ideology nor violence. Uh, in contrast to ideology and violence, 
Economic power addresses the people who are subjected to it only indirectly by organizing their material environment in a manner that forces them to comply with certain social logics. So let me briefly sketch out uh, the theory that I present in the book. And uh, let me begin with capitalist class relations. Uh, capitalist production presupposes the availability of labor power as a commodity, which in turn presupposes that a sufficiently large part of the workforce is denied access to the conditions of social reproduction outside of the market. One of the specific characteristics of capitalist class domination is that it's based on the, com and, and, and this is a quote from Marx, the complete separation between the workers and the ownership of the, of the conditions for the realization of their labor, end of quote. In pre-capitalist mode of production, by contrast, uh, class hierarchies and exploitation were based on the unity of producers and means of production. And for this reason, uh, the threat of physical coercion was necessary in order to reproduce the relationship of exploitation. Uh, in contrast to pre-capitalist mode of, of, of domination, the power of the capitalist class is based on the permanent separation of the producers from the means of production and subsistence. Um, with the consequence that the ruling class can, uh, as a rule, force workers to perform surplus labor without having to employ violence. They can simply deny them access to their means of survival. So this is the distinctive economic aspect of the capitalist class domination. The valorization of value inserts itself as a mediating moment in the human metabolism with the rest of nature, whereby workers are driven by their own needs to subject themselves to the demands of capital. Another unique feature of capitalist class domination is its impersonal nature, in contrast to the personal relations of dependence in pre-capitalist mode of production. Proletarians are tied to capital as such, not to a particular capitalist. And uh, this is a result of the specifically, uh, specifically capitalist relations between units of production, that is the horizontal relationships in, in contrast to the vertical class relationships. And the horizontal relationships between the units of production is the starting point of Marx's critique of political economy. In his theory of value, Marx demonstrates how the peculiar unity of social and private labor in capitalism transforms social relations among producers into a quasi autonomous system of real abstraction, of real abstractions imposing themselves on everyone. So when social relations among producers are mediated by the exchange of products of labor as commodities, their access to their conditions of existence is mediated by a market system in which the circulation of commodities and money generate compulsory standards and demands that these producers must meet in order to survive. This reading of the theory of value as a theory of abstract social domination is particularly well developed in the work of value form theorists such as Heinrich, Elbe, Pastone, and Kurz. And scholars in this tradition often downplay the significance of class domination in favor of an emphasis on what Adorno called, and this is a quote, the universal domination of mankind by exchange value, end of quote. So for these thinkers, the domination of proletarians by capitalists is a derived or a secondary form of, the, of a more fundamental domination of everyone by the value form. Um, and I think that while it's it, while it's important to recognize the, the class transcending nature of the power of value, it's e it's equally essential to understand the intimate connection between value and class. Uh, as Marx demonstrates in his dialectical analysis of the necessary relationship between value, money, capital, and the commodification of labor power, value actually presupposes class domination. Uh, in other words, the, the universal domination of everyone by the value form can only exist on the basis of the domination of proletarians by capitalists. This does not mean, however, that the horizontal relationships among producers can be reduced to a result of the vertical class relations. The latter is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the former, or put differently, the separation between the producers and the means of production does not in itself necessitate that social production is coordinated by means of the exchange of products of labor as commodities. For this reason, I think we have to understand the uh, horizontal and the vertical relations as two sets of distinct but interrelated relations of domination, which are both 
essential to the capitalist mode of production. Uh, in order to fully understand how capital reproduces its stranglehold on social reproduction, we need to be attentive to how these two dimensions mediate each other. So proletarians are subjected to capitalists by means of mechanisms of domination, which simultaneously subject everyone to the imperatives of capital. Uh, and this is what gives capitalist class domination its distinctively uh, impersonal character. So far, uh, I have presented a somewhat synchronic and static picture of the capitalist mode of production. In order to fully understand what mute compulsion is, um, we also need to take into account the dynamics of capitalist production. And this is the focus of the third part of my book. And I don't have time to go into details with this here. So let me just very briefly mention uh, the main ideas. Uh, I discuss the dynamics of capitalism under three headlines. Um, first, real subsumption. That is the, 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 the constant material restructuring of the production process, which is so characteristic of capitalism. This takes place on multiple levels from the micro level of the workplace uh, to capital relationship to natural processes, uh, to the global restructuring of the international division of labor through infrastructural projects and logistics. So by means of processes such as uh, introducing new technologies, de-skilling labor, altering landscapes, biotechnologically manipulating plants and animals, uh, and reorganizing the geography of production, capital st strives and tends to create a world in its own image. And in, in essence, uh, this is a, a, a kind of materialization of the logic of capital, and it, it increases the power of capital because it makes it more difficult to replace capitalism with something else. The second important dynamic is the creation and reproduction of a relative surplus population. Capitalism necessarily tends to generate a certain level of unemployment, which secures a certain level of competition among workers. And for this reason, the creation of a relative surplus population is also a mechanism of domination. And I think something similar can be said about economic crises, which is the third dynamic uh, I want to mention. Uh, crises tend to Crises tend to intensify the pressure of competition and leads to what Marx calls, uh, and I quote, the violent annihil annihilation of capital as a condition of its self-preservation, end of quote. So crises are not only the result of the inherent contradiction of capitalism, but also their temporary solution, uh, which prepare the way for a new round of accumulation. Um, okay, so that, that was my attempt to, to summarize the book. Uh, and in a, in a certain sense, one could say that what I attempt to do here is to view the capitalist economy as one big machinery of domination. And this implies a uh, total rejection of what we could call economistic conceptions of the economy, which is uh, the idea that the economy is an ontologically separate sphere of society governed by distinctive transhistorical economic logics or economic rationality. Such an economism can be found in mainstream economics, but it's also tacitly supported by much mainstream and critical political science and sociology insofar as they uh, tend sometimes to leave the study of the economy to the economists. Um, so, so such a kind of, this economistic conception of the economy has also been quite widespread in classical Marxism in the form of the idea that historical development uh, is ultimately caused by changes taking place in the economic basis, which in the last instance means that historical development is the result of a transhistorical tendency for the productive forces to de develop. I think that Marx's critique of political economy offers a powerful critique of economism because it rejects the idea that the economy is somehow ontologically distinct and governed by something like an economic rationality. Uh, such a perspective uh, is absolutely essential for what I do in my book because it makes it possible to view what is called uh, the economy as a, to see that as a set of historically specific relations of domination. So this is uh, probably where my work, I think, is most closely related to Samuel's work. Uh, and uh, I agree that there is no such thing as the economy. 
and I and I and, and I believe that the anti-economistic such an anti-economistic perspective is one of the most important and useful aspects of Marx's critique of political economy today. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. I'll just go ahead and jump in then. Um, so to start, just thanks to everyone for having me, to Cordelia and Edward for hosting and to Philip and Redway for inviting me and, and to Soren for his incisive and important argument, which I, I'm looking forward to engaging with. I also just want to note at the start that I was informed that the rules about red were really strict for Red May Seattle. And so I've not only worn my red, but last week I went onto a glacier and burned myself so that I could be imprinted in red uh, to show my commitments to all of you for today. Um, <laughs> I just want to say, uh, maybe to frame at the outset to bridge from what Soren said, the study of political economy, particularly capitalist political economy, often needs to engage with uh, a dialectic of part and whole. Uh, this is obviously a huge issue for understanding Marx's project, his writings, his engagement with Hegel, his critique of political economy. I'll just say that in, in our little conversation today, we are uh, framing, staging something of a dialectic here in that Soren has given a very focused, incisive argument. Um, and I'm going to step back really, really big and be quite broad and generalizing. Um, there's a number of specific arguments that will come out of that, but I may not push any of them all the way. Hopefully that gives us a framework for moving back and forth in the broader conversation among us and, and q and I, I guess I'd also say if anybody was tuning in for a debate between me and Sora, and I, I think that's going to be missed because I, I think the complementarities are too strong and the resonances are very powerful. And the fundamental argument that, that Soren's making for a kind of economic power that is distinct from ideological and violence, I think is absolutely central and crucial to understanding capitalist economics today. And in the book from which the title of this panel comes, There's No Such Thing as the Economy, I don't necessarily push that argument. But in my more recent book, I'm actually making really exactly that case in a different context and a different language. And I'll try to weave some of that in as I go through. I've framed these remarks as something of an intellectual biography. And that's not because I think my work and its history is of such crucial importance that everyone needs to hear all the background minutia. It's just that at this point, having spent about 15 years trying to study capitalist political economy, I don't really have a single argument or angle to press. Um, I'm, I'm not here to sell anyone anything. I, I do, though, I think have a broad set of experiences, some frameworks I've developed and worked with, and maybe it, every now and then an insight that I'd like to bring to bear on the conversation. So just to tell you why I got here, I want to say briefly that for the first decade of my career as an academic, I worked in a pretty recognizable vein of contemporary political theory, writing as a lot of political theorists do today on the very concept of politics, on the political, drawing from well-known authors, in my case, people like Foucault, Butler, Ranciere, other continental thinkers. But I was also, right from the beginning, deeply committed to interdisciplinarity and, and to a kind of alter disciplinarity which is why both my second and third books tried to build bridges between political theory and other fields, uh, critical television studies, feminist theory, queer theory. But at the time, and unlike the shift I'm going to describe here in a second, I think those interdisciplinary forays were always conducted from the kind of relative safety of a home discipline, one that I could always return to with new resources. So the goal was to broaden what political theory could mean or do, but the work didn't necessarily call that field into question. I think the work I've done over the last 15 years might actually do that, which makes my fit within political theory perhaps much less comfortable now than it once was. Now, the pivot for me, uh, it wasn't triggered by a development within an academic field. It wasn't a book I read. It was by events in the world and my personal links to them. And I could tell that story in detail, but the short version is quite simple. I bought a house in the UK in September 2006. That's about the peak of the housing market. In January 2008, I found myself with no choice but to sell it. And let's just say that didn't go well. And that's when I started reading housing bubble blogs, when I started studying the housing market closely, uh, trying to remember what I'd learned during my undergraduate degree in economics and thinking about the relationships between money, finance, value, the economy, politics, society. And at that time, I immediately began reading and teaching classical political economy, especially Marx. 
But the more I read, the less I felt I knew. And, and maybe that's the context for Edward's claim earlier that he doesn't know very much because he may have read more than most of us. Because the deeper into this I got, the more ignorant I felt. Uh, but I did become convinced of two points. And I think these are, are conclusions that a lot of people reach, but maybe don't say quite so directly as I'm going to say now, which is the first point, the paradigm of neoclassical economics, which is the ground of my undergraduate education in economics, and that of just about every single student in Europe, North America, and much of the world. That paradigm is absolutely bankrupt. And I mean this in the deepest sense, that if we took all of the college intro courses, intro to econ courses that are on the books, and we replace them with introduction to astrology courses, we would be no further away from understanding capitalist economics than we are now. And that's not a critique of astrology. It's a clear, a clear an example as I can come up with. The second point, though, is that the social science disciplines that we might call adjacent to economics, sociology, anthropology, history, above all political science, they are deeply culpable because they so often bracket off economics and the economy as an area that should be left to the work of the economists. And, and this is a self-critique. This is something that belongs to my own field of political theory within political science. So over this period of time, I became more and more certain that capitalism was far more complex and contradictory, far more difficult to make sense of than almost anyone allowed. And I think that Marx this is perhaps greatest gift to his readers is that he always takes capitalism to be a puzzle, a mystery to be solved. And perhaps even more important than Marx's own solutions to the puzzle is his presentation of it as a puzzle. Parenthetically here, I, th I think Marx was a great pedagogue in ways that are very important. So you take the question, what is profit? If you don't have an answer to that question, then you have no explanation whatsoever for capitalism. And as Marx pointed out, no one in classical political economy provided an answer. And as we can now say 150 years after Marx, the neoclassical paradigm that replaced the classical one is founded on an elision of that question. They don't answer the question of profit because they refuse to even recognize it as a question. So needless to say, my intellectual trajectory here forked rather significantly. And early in that journey along the new path, I set out to write a book on Marx and political theory. And maybe I thought at the time that I would get this out of my system and then return back to where I had been before in political theory. But that didn't go so well either. And in the end, the project of writing a book on Marx and political theory has turned into an almost two decade long project that to date includes four books. And I want to kind of just summarize a little bit of what those works are doing and how they're connected and frame them in relationship to Soren's upcoming book and the conversation here today. So the first stumble, as it were, in my simple plan is that I repeatedly discovered that the distance between, on the one hand, Marx's actual mature project of writing a critique of the paradigm of classical political economy, the distance between that and the norms, assumptions, expectations of 21st century contemporary political theory proved to be so wide as to be unbridgeable. There was no space in between there to write. So I found myself writing what I thought of even at the time as the book I have to write first in order to then be able to write a book on Marx. And that book, which was published in 2013, was called Bearing Side of Society in Mind. And that title is a paraphrase from a key line in the key section, section three of Marx's key text, supposedly on method, that is the 1857 introduction. I used a reading of that manuscript from Marx to construct the spine for a project that tried to give a theory of society, of the social order, of the social formation. And central to that argument was this refusal that Soren was speaking of at the end in, in the language of economism, a refusal of separate domains, subdomains within society, not only the economic or the economy, but also the political, the social. And that separation, a kind of economistic logic has been central to a lot of work in political theory where the political is a thing. I argued, a social formation is constituted by social, political, economic, cultural, we can extend this list, threads that are woven together in such a way that they can never be disaggregated. Disaggregation is a term that social scientists today very much like to focus on so as to mobilize data-driven techniques, the data has to be disaggregated. These threads of the social, the political, the cultural cannot be disaggregated. This means that the actual argument for the polemical line that is the title of my next book and of our conversation today, there's no such thing as the economy, 
that argument actually came out of the Bering Society in Mind book. And while the No Such Thing book is in a way my book on Marx, it also didn't turn out as I expected. The research and writing of that book was an exercise in humility in which I repeatedly found myself coming up with what I thought were insights, sometimes making new discoveries, sometimes thinking I had finally disproved some massive trend in the literature, only to then later find out that these were things a lot of writers already knew. I think one of the most frustrating things about the state of the current literature on Marx is that absolutely bad, just untenable readings of Marx's text continue to circulate in some areas as if they remain not just plausible, but obviously correct. Um, you can try doing a literature review on Marx's labor theory of value and you will quickly discover what I mean. On the other hand, much of the best work on Marx is written in such a way as to assume that everyone has already read volume one of Capital two dozen times and already knows all the key terms and players in the debates. And this is also problematic. I, I wanna know who first thought it was a good idea to give us the acronym LTRPF. I mean, really, law of the tendency? These things are not helpful in trying to understand capitalist economics today. So this book, There's No Such Thing as the Economy, really became more of a bridging work. The goal was to take the broadly conceived value form reading of Marx and make it accessible to a much wider audience. The book makes a different case for this reading by first linking it to direct concrete political events, uh, especially the Wells Fargo scandal that dominated the US news cycle for quite some time and came to serve as something of a synecdoche for the problem of capitalist greed. And second, braiding it with strands of contemporary post-foundational theory. So in particular, I read Marx's historical method through the lens of Nietzschean and Foucauldian genealogy. And this exercise is not meant to reduce Marx to those extant terms, but rather quite the opposite, to show that in many ways, Marx was doing a more powerful form of genealogy well before Foucault. And so this bridging work points toward the possibility of a kind of critical political economy that has or can make space within political theory and political science. And it's by taking up, or perhaps just by performatively assuming the existence of that space that I was able to produce the third book in this odd sequence. And that's called Capitalist Economics, which was just out earlier this year. And the book emerged directly from that previous decade of teaching. It was my attempt to uh, walk the walk that I had often talked. That is, I kept saying to colleagues in economics and political science, that we needed a way to introduce students to political economy that was neither one, a retread of neoclassical economics in some lighter form, or two, a direct critique of neoclassical economics, which just presupposes that students know that model to begin with, or three, a course that was fundamentally a history of economics course, a history of economic thought, not an introduction to economics. And so I drafted, um, this book as the main text for a new introduction to political economy course that I first offered in spring 2020. So just as the pandemic hit, and it's really thanks to three great groups of undergraduate students. I taught the course three times fairly quickly and five just unbelievably amazing uh, graduate student TAs that I ended up with a book. And the goal of that book is to give students and very much general readers a way of making sense of what Soren lucidly calls economic power and which I call in that book, Economic Forces and Relations. I think this is probably the most substantive connection between our works that overlap in all sorts of ways, but his emphasis on economic power as a third form of power and my structuring of the capitalist economics books behind the very idea that there are real economic forces and relations in the world that are a form of power that we must understand and pay attention to, but is it, it is a power that is itself produced by the existence of social legal property relations and the historical development of a particular social order. So this text is a, it's really short. There's no graphs or statistics and there's almost no citations. It starts by showing that there's no such thing as the economy, that instead the economic forces and relations present in the society depend upon its location in history. It then offers the basics of money, profit and commodities drawing on a solution that's produced when you throw the best of Ricardo, Marx and Keynes into a blender. And it ends with chapters on investment, banking, an overview of what I call the rules of capitalism, which I think is a better um, and a much more straightforward term than laws of tendencies. The book is anti-disciplinary. It's not meant to be a part of econ courses or political science courses. It doesn't presuppose any disciplinary or other knowledge at all. And the goal is to help students and readers get a basic grasp about how capitalist economics, 
because that's the economics we live under, not feudal or tributary or any other, how capitalist economics works. Um, it's either a bold experiment or a kind of arrogant and naive project. Um, it was released just a few months ago, so I guess time will tell. Uh, and in the meantime, just to kind of finish up with something I think is maybe bracketed from what we're doing here, but to finish this intellectual biography, I'm finishing a fourth and maybe it's the final book in this tetralogy, I'm not sure, a book on money. I think that all of the of all the enigmas within capitalism, money may be the most mysterious and therefore the most subject to willful obfuscation, naive confusion, outright fraud. You only have to skim the headlines of financial news these days to bear witness to this. Um, you only have to think anything about crypto to see this. I think the problem here is that, as is almost always the case, the neoclassical paradigm gets money completely and utterly wrong. But unlike with other general principles of political economy, where we actually have some great resources to turn to, with money, our options are really scant. And so in this book, I'm trying to remedy that problem and to provide something like a definitive overview of the history of theories of money, and then my best effort at a better theory. And this work is probably, like I said, somewhat external to this conversation, but I will just end by saying that in the same way that I'm convinced we don't understand capitalist economics if we have no good answer to the question of what is profit, I'm now convinced that we cannot really make sense of contemporary capitalism if we don't have a handle on money markets, from repo markets to foreign exchange markets, from oil futures to credit default swaps. The capitalist economy is a monetary economy through and through, and I hope that this is a a path for future research and thinking and exploration uh, akin to the project, say, coming out of value form theory that Sword and I are both gesturing toward as we build readings of Marx and articulations of capitalist political economy. Thanks. Thanks so much for all that. Um, so next up, uh, I'm, I'm gonna comment briefly and then Edward is as well. Um, hopefully our comments will dovetail at least a little. Um, our, our remarks probably won't be as well developed as the, the really insightful talks given by both Sam and Soren today. I, I wanted to say what a fan I am of, of both of their works um, and how exciting it is, I think, that, I, that there are so many people picking up the same inflection point that perhaps NML and VFT stuff left us with. Um, because we, it's, it seems like there's quite a lot of agreement on growingly out of this literature on, on what we can say generalized commodity production does. More and more we can say about Marx's sketch of how it worked, of how to lay that out uh, ontologically. Um, both of your works uh, refer to capitalism as a social logic Although this isn't really something, there isn't like a definitive text I could point to and say this is this is where someone lays out what a social logic is epistemologically. I think it's it's telling of all of these people picking up this this really dynamic thing, which happens in in capital and in Marx's work in general methodologically. Um, and the part of your works that I appreciate so much is you're both turning it so sharply towards the political. Uh, you're you're both like doing something I would call political theory in some sense, um, in, in moving out and taking uh, a lot of really brilliant Marx scholarship and finding a way to, to put the edge on them. Um, and so uh, in, in our role as, as gadflies here today, uh, I, I'm gonna try to pick up a little on something, on, on a, a kind of implicit thread uh, in both of your work, Soren's work a little more so, which I hope will help us talk a little more sharply about the, I think somewhat of a, either like an implicit difference or at minimum an underdetermination in the way we talk about normativity here. Um, so uh, Soren's book uh, is, I think the, I, it, it's really magisterial. I really hope you all read it. Um, and the thing it does, uh, so precisely, so sharply, is demonstrate how in, in, his, in his really dynamic, politically focused account, um, we can move from talking about Marx's work, from talking about capital, the social logic, to uh, what capital does apropos of power and apropos of domination. Uh, and this has been a thread that's been picked up. Uh, Soren, you do such a great job di dissecting all of the 
previous approaches taken to this in the literature. Um, there's been a lot of talk of domination, uh, abstract social domination, domination after Philip Pettit and William Clay Roberts's work. Um, and the, the thing I appreciate so much about mute compulsion is that it tries to, to really formalize this and anchor this in a, in a self-contained way, um, which lets us say a lot more about what we mean when we're saying social domination is going, abstract social domination is going on. Domination uh, sort of in the sense of uh, pettit power over is going on. Um, but I think there's, there's still a little bit of an ambiguity for me at least in, in coming to the work. And the ambiguity for me uh, sort of starts with the concept of power and the relationship between power and domination. So the question I wanna focus in on, because I think this opens maybe a line of divergence between the work here, is the distinction between power and domination. So we, we can obviously, uh, Luke's who sort of has the authoritative treatment of power in the philosophical, political, theoretic literature sets up power. He's, he's coming to it, trying to refute work uh, of Dahl, uh, refute a lot of work in this American political scientific tradition which has really neutered power. It's turned power into just the capacity to, to do something, to get something done. Like, what, what's the point to this? Um, this, it, it doesn't have, it's focused pretty narrowly on elites. Uh, and so Luke's really hones us in and gives us a picture of power over. Uh, I, I'm not gonna address at great length the distinction between the accounts of Luke's Pettit and a couple, not that there are so many like Brenker, uh, analytic treatments of domination. Um, but the, the crucial thing we can say is that there's power over here, uh, ability to alter choice set. Um, but the thing I wanna pick up on a little bit is I'm not convinced that just power apropos of either ability to alter choice set in the way domination is handled traditionally or power in the way economic power is set up uh, apropos of power as the means to alter uh, the sort of social configuration of uh, means for social reproduction is really enough for us to delineate which forms of power and even potentially which forms of domination we're okay with. Uh, so, so to pick up on a, a kind of mundane example, um, if, if I am a uh, kinder, maker of, of beloved European chocolates, um, and I have the, the Kinder egg. Uh, and the Kinder egg, uh, as you know, um, or may, may or may not know, uh, got banned from the States for, for being involved in choking children. Um, if I am the FDA and I strike the Kinder egg from the market because it chokes children, I'm certainly restricting the choice set of all Americans pretty meaningfully. Now you can say this, this doesn't matter. You can say this isn't a choice over something that, that counts. There isn't uh, perhaps dependency here, but as it happens, you were you had the capacity to make a choice to buy a Kinder Egg. Now you do not. Um, and in the same way, uh, maybe there are nuances here apropos of proceduralism that can legitimate this, but it's kind of hard to say. Um, if I'm Kinder and my egg chokes people and I get bad press, uh, I too can decide to pull the Kinder Egg from the market. But also when I'm doing this, uh, should I, I am removing a choice from everyone's lives. Um, I'm pretty clearly fencing in their capacity for making autonomous decisions, at least a little, even if kind of in a trivial way. Uh, but the question is, is this, uh, uh, what, where are we gonna draw the cutoff point where this is or isn't an exercise of power we find unjust or whether this is or isn't domination? Um, and I think, the reason this actually matters for us at the end of the day politically is because the people making apologetics for capitalism, probably economic power doesn't necessarily surface in discussions of mainstream Anglo-American neoclassical econ in a way. But, uh, and I really like this quote from the, this epigraph from Friedman at the start of the piece, uh, mainstream economists frame, you know, 
the marketplace is a way of coordinating the economic activities of millions by means of the voluntary cooperation of individuals. Uh, and so economists generally seem to think this is a good thing. Um, in in Sam, uh, Sam's book, uh, I, I know uh, he, he picked up on this as, uh, and there's no such thing as the economy, a, a case of the market writing its own values, writing its own values, which maybe conflict with our own. Um, or you could say something to the effect of like market rationality or social surplus rationality, if you want to be a little more Catholic, um, is rationality as such when we come to the marketplace. Um, and so the question is, if an apologist for capitalism would agree with us on capitalism, uh, on, on capital as an emergent property possessing economic power, qua, you know, something that has to do with the way in which social relations of domination reproduce themselves or forcing people to do certain things by reorganizing the social and material conditions of their existence. We're all going to agree that generalized commodity production has a big effect on the choices I can and cannot make, on, on the choiceability of all the things that affect me in my life. When I go to the market, it, it does this in both a, a sort of positive and negative way. At minimum, it creates new choices. So apropos of the discourse today, I can say in generalized commodity production, I have the choice to go to a restaurant. Um, and we can debate, you know, whether restaurants make sense under certain social formations, whether restaurants make sense from the perspective of domination or, or what we want to have in a society that isn't generalized commodity production. But at a pretty material level, uh, any way I politically make the decision to not have something like this uh, is already going to meet the bar for power is already going to meet the bar for economic power. And so the question is, when are we saying something about this in terms of domination? When are we saying something about this in terms of justice or the good or normativity or what have you? And people are pretty dicey in how they wanna draw the line in the literature, I think. Um, I, I, I've dealt with this to an extent. People talk about the arbitrary, the, the arbitrary exercise of power. Um, and you, you can sort of break this down into kind of substantialist versus proceduralist accounts. People, and, and some of the ways people have tried to get out of this literature are by saying, you know, maybe discursive isolation is where, where we're gonna say constitutes an arbitrary exercise of power. Maybe we're gonna say uh, something that compels me in this really strong sense, like uh, something that affects a basic need. Like if I don't sell my labor power, uh, I don't have anything to eat. Uh, I'm going to die. It's the kind of thing that would compel even, you know, the Aristotle's madman in the Nicomachean ethics, the guy who you can't make do anything because he's afraid of nothing. Um, but uh, I, I wanna tease out which ones of these we are and aren't okay with a little more, because I think this is also maybe the route to explicating, to elucidating a little further, the distinction between the capitalist value system that we maybe don't like uh, and the grounds for our finding something to be wrong with the values that generalized commodity production gives us. Uh, so are we finding them wrong because they conflict with something like need fulfillment? Are we finding them wrong because we, we, we want to say something about these procedurally? Um, this is kind of like a, a, a sketchy topic, a, a sketchy question to throw back at you all. Um, but I, I, I want to draw this out a little more because I, I think this will help us maybe uh, move from, from talking so precisely and sharply about capitalism qua social logic to talking about what we want out of non-capitalisms, um, why we're justified in wanting it, and what we do in cases when we have to adjudicate disputes where... Uh, Someone else is dominate where where you know like restaurants where uh, someone is getting dominated uh, and also cutting off this avenue of dominating is restricting the choice sets of someone else in a meaningful way is exercising power over even if this power over is vested in uh, like a democratic authority or an emergent property like the market or arguably even like a higher stratum uh, a higher stratum from the natural level. Uh, something like 
you know, maybe you could attribute this kind of power, although I certainly wouldn't, to something like natural necessity, um, to something like some property of, of the human natural metabolism. And this, this obviously cuts against the, the wonderful job both of you do in denaturalizing a lot of what we come to thinking about the critique of political economy with. Um, but uh, I, I, I hope maybe it provides grounds for, for future conversation in the rest of the panel. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Edward now. Um, and hopefully, like I said, this dovetails with some of what they have to say. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I mean, just obviously thanks for for, for having us um, to, to the rest of the panel for, for being here. Um, uh, I've, I've, you know, Soren, I just started reading your book, uh, for this. So I, I'm, 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 I've been reading that and I've been enjoying, enjoying it a lot. Uh, like, like she said, you know, it's just, it seems to be that we're all kind of, it's nice that a lot of people are sort of addressing the same problem at the same time. And, uh, this is hopefully, you know, reflective of, of something that's just going to continue to grow. And, and hopefully that maybe this discussion is part of that. Um, Sam, I've been, a uh, I, I read your book right after it came out. I found your YouTube lecture on, uh, labor theory of value is a capitalist fairy tale, and ever since then, I've been a, a dogmatic Chambersite, um, ready to die at the barricades for you. So I'm really, really happy that we get a chance to sort of talk about this stuff um, as well. So um, I'm I'm going to focus more on on that. I, if anything, that book and and some of the the talks that you gave around it and and for it. Um, I guess to start off, I'll say you kind of do some some interesting things there that I re I really want to push you on push back a little, but also push you forward some of the implications um, about some of the things that are, are said or unsaid there. Um, I said this to Cordelia the other day that, you know, like it's sort of like uh, uh, in the sense that you can only tell someone that you're really, really friends with that they have bad breath. Like I want to sort of, you know, push back in a loving way. And I don't, I don't mean to get this, you know, nasty at all, but I, I do sort of really want to see, I'm curious about what you, what the two of you would really say about some of these things. So um, to start off with you, you make a claim, you have a Outside of the book, you did a lecture, which was recorded also on YouTube. Uh, I started just consuming everything I could find um, uh, of yours. And you have a lecture, which is on there, same title of the book. Um, There's no such thing as the economy. Um, and you start making some claims about, about value. Uh, and one of the things that you said there, uh, and it's sort of a, a passing remark. You, you talk about a little bit, you basically said the way that we talk about value, both in the sense of like a, uh, you know, a hierarchy of like our moral estimations, as well as like... Uh, our own, like uh, the way that I might sentimentally value my grandmother's furniture or something is the exact same sense in which we can say that, or, or is not, maybe not the exact same sense, but the way that we say, I value this as a commodity, the, the commodity having, possessing whatever, or maybe that's maybe substantial, so it's naughty to say, but the sense that it, we talk about values of commodities in, in this sense, we're actually saying the same sort of thing, only that it takes a peculiar economic form. Um, and you don't say it there, but in a sense, this sort of transhistoricizes value in the sense that value takes on a particular historical meaning at a certain time, but otherwise value doesn't come into being at a certain point and then disappear after. Um, and so I sort of want uh, to, to push you on that a little bit, push you forward or backward or whichever way. Um, I think that's a really interesting point. And, and actually, one of the strengths of, of, of your work, I uh, the genealogical stuff has actually completely changed the way that I, I think and read Marx now, frankly. So I think it's really powerful. Um, you've gotten me to the point where I, I now say that, um, you know, Foucault is the first great German theorist and Marx is just stealing everything he said, you know, it's, um, so uh, I, I really think that's very powerful and, and sort of pushing, pushing that in a different direction, uh, sort of in the direction that something William Clare Roberts says, he says, he talks about Marx as a, a proto-Austrian. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a book that came out, uh, in 2020, 2019 by Frederick Carey Pitts, who we had on the podcast called Value. And he sort of actually teases that out with, uh, with Marx. Thinking about, uh, uh, well, actually, um, uh, more heat than light to kind of structure his argument. Um, uh, the, the, the way that the critique of political economy sort of, on the other side of it, the incomplete break, but on the other side of that break, if we can sort of say that there is another side of it, uh, the move from the substantialist or conserve, you know, conservationist theory of value toward a field or a relational theory of value um, in Marx. And uh, in, in a sense, the way that you talk about value in that lecture, um, sort of in a sense, rather than saying Marx is a proto-Austrian, but instead actually extending the genealogical critique of political economy to the stuff that Marx never got to see or never got to write about, extending it to the Austrians, to the free market, to the neoclassicals that I think you're trying to do with this new book, Capitalist Economics to a Point, is to sort of address those claims 
um, in an introductory way, but still sort of bring that critique forward. Um, so rather than simply saying proto-Austrian, but also actually backwards, sort of, you know, let's talk about where we can come to think these things, why we believe the things we do and say the things that we do, and why this word value takes on all these meanings. Uh, in a sense that the Austrian economists, when they're saying that we're talking about value as being subjective, um, this is exactly the kind of way that you're talking about value here for Marx. Um, now, obviously, they take different political implications from this. I'm not going to say they don't, right? I'm not going to say that he's, he's, he's Hayek. But the, the fact that they are both talking about the, the way that subjective preferences manifest and the, way, the, what we, um, the fact that the things that we value take on this peculiar economic form, that is more or less uh, something that the Austrians, I think, are kind of thinking through in a similar way with two different results. Um, now, this is not even unique to the Austrians. This is already in the history of economic thought as, as you know, for a long time. There's sort of this bad history where it's the objective theories of value and then the subjective ones in 1870, everybody just forgets that they held labor theories of value the day before. That's not really true. But when it comes to the Austrians, especially, I think, and what they start to do with this in terms of aggregating and start talking about information and, and the market says this objective process thing that very hard for us to plan with the calculation debate. And again, a lot of this is already in Smith and things with the invisible hand, um, the benevolence of the butcher and all that stuff. So in, in this sense, I sort of want to, one of the things that I want to do, and one of the things I've been sort of, I guess, working on is putting Marx and the Austrians in, in dialogue for that reason, and partly out of your work uh, for these kinds of reasons, because I think that's a really provocative uh, way of looking at it, as value is basically transhistorical in this sense, uh, as well as through um, Pitts and, and William Clark Roberts and uh, Michael Heinrich as well. Um, but the other thing, I guess, and this is where I would maybe push back is, and this really dovetails with what, with what Cordelia was just saying, which is that being that we can have this conversation about um, you know, the fact that our subjective valuations take on this peculiar economic form and that sort of uh, describes both what Marx is doing as well as what the Austrians are doing, and both in the sense that the Austrians are assuming an, an impersonal mechanism which distributes justice and does all these things above our heads that we can have, you know, we might individually somehow constitute between our, in our, in our, in our relations with one another, but at the same time, we cannot directly plan or, you know, play like whack-a-mole with uh, that it's this thing that you know, the invisible hand that stands above us in a sense. It's just a very complicated network. And in the same sense that Marx comes to the same conclusions in terms of the abstract social domination uh, of, of, you know, capitalist logic, uh, of, the, of the rule of value, um, that as Soren, I think, does a great job of, of describing. Um, the question is really, uh, being that these, both of these projects, I think, do so much in common, the only real difference is that we just moralize them differently. And so I would question, push back a little bit, not, not push back because I disagree with you. I'm not saying we should all be reading Hayek and, and celebrating that, but why is it normatively that we actually simply, we decide that domination is domination uh, and one is, 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 is not? Uh, you know, why is our ethical framework, why is our uh, normative estimation the right one? Uh, and I think this is, this is sort of um, something that, that you almost evaded in that lecture, Sam. Someone, you had a heckler in the crowd that said, why is domination bad? Uh, and you, I remember you were kind of like, what? And frankly, if someone asked me why domination is bad, I would probably say the same thing, like, what a stupid question. But at the end of the day, why is d domination bad? Or rather, why are we framing this particularly as domination rather than simply as this wonderful market mechanism, which we need because impersonality is the only way in order to have non-discriminatory uh, social practice or something like that. Um, just to sort of push that conversation in that direction um, and, and, and see what you say, um, but otherwise, you know, both of you have fantastic work. So thank you very much. Soren, did you want to jump in first? Should I take up there? There was a couple of specific things I thought I might be able to frame in response to what you said, Edward, which was very illuminating, very helpful and, and pushing at some uh, really important questions going well beyond my work. And actually, I do think they, they linked up with, with some of what Cordelia worked out. I'll just say a couple of things and then we might we might come back, but I don't wanna go on at great length. Um, I think the first sort of framing, and this is overly simplistic, but hopefully it captures something, which is that we can, I think we can look at three different ways of thinking about capitalist value. One would be Ricardo and Ricardo's life project, which was hoping to find a standard of value. Um, and, and Srafa's work on Ricardo was really, really important here in showing that over the course of Ricardo's life, 
he never found it, but he kept trying to. And I think what we, I think Marx learned more from Ricardo than anyone. And I think it's partially because he was reading Ricardo in Ricardo's failed project. And what Ricardo did is held on to the faith that someday we'll find the standard of value. And Smith could just assume that it was corn and it was given. And Ricardo actually worked out the math and said, no, that won't work. Um, what if it's this? What if it's this? And never found it. And, and I have a tendency to read um, Marx as pushing Ricardo toward a sort of deconstructive end that it won't be there. There is not going to be this singular standard of value. So, but Ricardo was one, that's what he was trying to do. Uh, two would be Bailey um, as, a, as a true proto-Austrian. And we could call it Bailey or we could call it Menger, but it's going to be the same thing, which is that it is purely subjective. Um, valuation is just, we go on Amazon to search for the four items that we need and we are deciding subjectively and other market actors are deciding subjectively that it's purely subjective. Um, and then, then there's a mechanism where you take the purely subjective and you, in a Hayekian way, make it objective. That is, it's counterposed across the entire market and it creates price that is dictated to us, but it's fundament is this subjective valuation. Now, I think Will, has, Will Roberts has an insight when he says kind of polemically, provocatively, let's read Marx as a proto-Austrian. The insight is to dislodge reading him as a Smithian or a Ricardian who has a substantive labor theory of value. And that's brilliant and I'm completely on board. But I don't think we can actually take it all that way. I don't think Marx's understanding of value fits with Bailey's or Menger's because Bailey's and Menger's are purely subjective and Marx's is social. Prices are not just randomly produced by supply and demand. There is a law of value undergirding them. Socially necessary labor time is a real thing. It's not objective and transhistorical, it's socially conditioned. But so I think Marx's conception of value is social and is therefore not Bailey or Menger. And, and just a good reference point for people who wanna dig into this, and you might already have done so, Edouard, but I think Chris Author's reading where he basically says, no one's taken seriously enough, not just Marx's response to Bailey, but Bailey's critique of a Marxist project and the need to kind of reconstruct maybe even more robustly than Marx does. Because Marx kind of has a tendency to dismiss Bailey in places he engages with him. But Arthur says, no, we've really got to take this seriously. Um, I would be guided by that. I think Arthur is a reading of Marx that shows us that he's not a proto-Austrian. And of course, interestingly, Arthur is doing a form of value form theory, which would be the rhetorical edge that Will gets when he uses the proto-Austrian jumping off point. Now, if you add all that up, um, I think that you don't just get we're moralizing capitalism differently because I think that we're getting a different conception of value. Um, but I also think, I mean, this goes back to what I said in my opening remarks is Marx's actual understanding of how capitalism works and the critique that is embedded within that, in that we have an argument for how the value form comes about and preponderates. We have an argument for the production of surplus value, and that argument is indelibly tied to a relation of expropriation. Um, now, one could say, how does one subjectively value that? So there could be a kind of, um, pro-capitalist reading of Marx that says, I agree, here's the answer to where, where profit comes from. It's drawn from the fund of surplus value and surplus value is extracted in the wage labor relationship. And there is something like domination in it. And the pro-capitalist in this logic I'm throwing out says, and I don't care. But even at that point, we would have a very, very different analysis of capitalism. We would have kind of undermined the grounds of liberalism and capitalism being compatible because we would say we don't actually have freedom. We have relations of unfreedom. We're just, as pro, as pro capitalists here, okay with it. Um, so, but I think the fact that we have that means that our arguments, our normative arguments, our arguments about a political future, um, I think we have a critique of capitalism in Marx built into the very understanding of it. And that does not have to be an external moral critique, which doesn't mean it's not very much a critique bound up with values. Um, and so, so that's the way I would sort of work through that. And I think it's um, the key thing is if I'm right, if Chris Arthur is right about, and, and Will Roberts is wrong, um, that Marx is not just on the side of the Austrians, but that he's got this third choice there. Okay, can, can I can I ask you a question, Cordelia and Edward? 
Um, because I think both of you raised the question of normativity and, uh, you know, Kadir, you, you asked what's, what's, why is it that we think that there's something wrong with capitalism? What's, what is it exactly that's wrong about capitalism? And uh, Edward, you, you raised the question of why is domination bad and what's, what kind of argument do we want to make there? And I think I, 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 I'm thinking about why it's important to come up with an answer to that question. Because in a certain sense, I think that it's if 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 we if we analyze and describe capitalism as it works, I think it's quite clear to everyone who understands capitalism that we would all be better off by abolishing it. And I you know, in a, in, a, in a certain sense, I'm just thinking that it comes down to a political choice, you know, who, whose side are you on? What do you want to fight for and, and uh, against? And uh, I'm not sure that it's, uh, I'm not sure that it's, it's so important to be able to come up with a coherent um, ethical argument or a, a coherent argument about normativity um so i'm so so i'm curious to hear what you what what you what you would say to that question of why it's why can, why is it in, yeah and can Sam, i just underline that question no i just think that's i think that's exactly the right question i think that's exactly the right question i mean i would only i would only maybe make it slightly more like if we wanted to think really broad mindedly, if we understand how capitalism works, I think you said, Soren, that we'd all be better off by abolishing it. Or at the least, we'd be dramatically better off by radically curtailing it in so many ways. Um, right. But but the idea that if we really understood how it works, anyone could be OK with the status quo, it would be a circular. You would have to go back. No, you're not actually following how it works. If you're following how it works, it, it can't be that the way it's working now is the way we want. Um, and. And I guess, yeah, I, I just think that's a, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I, thanks. And, and I uh, just just to add uh, like a, a minor uh, uh, thing is that in a, in a way we can say that I think that we can conclude that capitalism is a system of domination. If, and, if, and if we if we're interested in fighting for freedom, we should fight against capitalism. And then we could say, what well, what's what's wrong with domination, or what's so good about freedom? And in a, in a in a certain sense, I would just say it comes down to you know what 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 all of us we all of us have have to make a like a, a political choice and decide whether we are on the side of freedom or domination. And perhaps there's no uh, perhaps there's no absolute like. Uh, moral or ethical uh, foundation for that. Perhaps it's, it's perhaps there's just a, only a political choice. Did that make sense? Yeah, so uh, first of all, um, I'm my intuitions are very much of the like, how could anyone possibly be for capitalism type? But most of the people I talk to don't really have these intuitions. Even the people who have what I consider like very simpatico lefty intuitions. I, I can talk to people who are very sincerely concerned about uh, exploitation. Um, but if they're liberals, they're going to frame it in terms of the classic point of, well, the labor share has really gone down in Western democracies and the capital share has gone up. And shouldn't we redistribute? Or if they're talking about climate change, they say something like, it's really terrible how nobody's priced in this externality. Somebody's got to do something about this. And if you pull mainstream economists, you know, most of them, in, in spite of whatever we can say about their politics, uh, something like U Chicago regularly has this panel where they pull mainstream economists and something like 85, 90% of them were like, yeah, we should really have a super high carbon tax globally. Like if you go around and you talk to these mainstream economists, every single one you talk to basically is going to say, yeah, we should have a carbon tax of like 100 to $120 a ton. Crazy values, higher values than the 
than the highest values of like the EU states, which have most aggressively tried to get carbon down. But it seems like there's this kind of meaningful conceptual impasse because we don't, when, when we phrase our things this way, they have, they're like, well, I agree with you on this and that but you haven't shown me really why I need to do the stuff that Mark specifically is talking about to achieve this. The big asks, the stuff like no about abolition of money. Like what is Marx? What is capital without the abolition of money? It's nothing, right? The, if you, it, it, this is the point that William Claire Roberts did such a good job of, of, of underlining. If, if we talk about capital as a political speech act, it is going to be in large part for the abolition of money against people who didn't think this was maybe necessary. And most of the people I talk to who feel like, yeah, I'm on the side of good stuff too, probably aren't with me on the side of, and this is why money got to go. Um, and so when we draft in power and domination and the real conceptual intuitional distinction between power and domination, the, way, the reason we carve these the conceptions out differently uh, is that do we want domination to be a relationship that's always unjust. We want domination to be, it is a sub, it is a subcategory of power. We've got the concept of power. Power obviously cannot always be unjust. Um, and if it were, we'd be pretty screwed because exercising power in general, I gave a couple examples of how uh, we're often justified in modifying the choice sets or the choiceability of someone else. Or at minimum, we'd have to argue pretty hard to get out of the trap of in order to make a case either why this is wrong or why this isn't actually domination or at minimum isn't power over. Um, but power in general, uh, we're, we're always we're involved in saying things to people. And when we talk about power in terms of choice sets, my if we have like some kind of like pre-capitalist economy, uh, if, if we have, if I'm like a cobbler, my making a shoe in this village says something meaningful about whether or not you can or can't get a shoe in this village. Can you compel me to make shoes? If I say, actually no more shoes for me, I think, I think I'm gonna stop making them. I'm gonna be a shepherd. Uh, you're this, pretty materially changes the choices available to you. But when we we want to flag why this is already power, it's already power over, it's already power over affecting choices. But we want to flag why this is or isn't domination because we don't, we, we want a real strong argument, in my opinion, to try to win over the people who are like, I'm with you on all the principles, I'm with you on the ends, but I don't see why money has to go. I don't see, why can't I just have my idealized, imperialism-free, pleasant Nordic social democracy where I've abstracted all of the problems away and we've agreed that we're gonna coordinate everything globally with the super UN? Um, because that's the kind of like live alternative in a, bunch, in a lot of the people I talk to's minds. And maybe that's not politically realistic. It very well couldn't be. Um, but just saying that's not politically realistic, I'm not really sure is enough because is are we winning big political victories either? I mean, my 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 ridiculous like social democracy, uh, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not doing great. It's it's not really a live option, but at least it's 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 you know like polling twenty percent. Um, whereas my thing, it's it's a pretty big ask. I I, I want to demonstrate uh, what it is that they necessarily can't do. And in order to do that, I, I think we need to demonstrate not just why generalized commodity production involves economic power and economic power over, but why this economic power and economic power over isn't just the kind of invisible hand stuff Edward is talking about. Isn't the kind of stuff where it's like, well, this is coordination. We're doing like Austrian, like, isn't it so cool you get cheap pencils type stuff? Because um, it seems like a lot of people are if I if I go up to the economists and I present them with a really well argued account, they would probably agree that this is economic power, that it meets the threshold for power in this and that way. And if they're liberals, they probably are intuitionally on the side of freedom too. At least they think they are. Because um, if I if I if I go and I, I canvass liberals talking about this, they're going to set they're going to set you know a requirement up for welfare, you know, nominal autonomy, well informedness. And you see this in like when people like Senate Nussbaum try to 
de utility talking about welfare and economics. Um, and so demonstrating why these relation why why we can bring in domination is demonstrating how certain kinds of power over uh, might be fine, how we draw the line between which ones are fine and which aren't, and how the ones which are constitutive of capitalism are in all instances those that we're not going to be fine with. So I guess that's like my intuition, political answer for, for why. And then that's also kind of the, the, the back end, the, the conceptual answer to your question. Yeah, and just to just to follow up on that really quick. Um, yeah, I mean, basically the point of of me asking the Austrian thing is isn't even to say we should, you know, like let's. I, I'm this isn't. I don't enjoy your work for some like really like fucked up. I'm a right libertarian that just loves to read, you know, good Marxist literature. No, you know, I I actually think that the most important aspect of Marx's work and why I read him and why I think he's relevant isn't because of you know some inevitable tendency toward communism. Isn't because of these, uh, you know, uh, a, a theory of crisis, which means that. The system is going to fall apart on its own as a political project. I think we have to be meaningfully against something, and and I think that the 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 role of domination in Marx's work is actually the most like of central importance and for and for what we can really use him for and uh, build a political project around. And so simply, so the the point about the Austrian thing, basically saying that you know, the Austrians, even even Smith before the Austrians and Marx, all of these thinkers of, of society. All of these social thinkers all have this notion of an impersonal mechanism that's that kind of stands over us and does all of these things. My question is, why is one? Why should we say that is domination? Isn't to simply say like you know like why can't we celebrate capitalism? It's to say that if we and it's also not enough to simply say like well if you really understand the system. My point is is why is it that this understanding of the system is the one that really understands the system? And I don't think we can just leave this up to a mere political choice as if it's an uninformed choice or as if we're 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 picking and choosing based on um, radical rhetoric or, or, you know, because our the books we read or something like that. No, I, I think as a real serious political project, which is something that, you know, Cordelia and I are both, you know, really passionate about. And we spend a lot of time on the podcast about that, uh, is, is really trying to build a, a serious political project. Uh, I know serious political project and, and podcast is kind of antithetical, but this is something we do care about, uh, is, is why domination, uh, really trying to build a, a good notion of what that means. That doesn't mean we don't have our own answers for it, frankly. This is something we spend a lot of time on. Um, but we do want to push you on that sort of stuff because I, I really want to, 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 you know, throw a really broad net about what this discussion ought to look like because I think this is the right discussion to have, um, not because uh, we're making a political choice otherwise, but because we are making a political choice to take this seriously and to really try and, and, and iron out uh, what this means because you can't just say if you really understand the system, you you, you know it's domination. My point is that to, to say it is domination presupposes some understanding of the system. You know, why is this understanding adequate? And what are the political implications? So that's kind of uh, what I think. What the two of us are sort of pushing at here. I'm gonna make what I, I think uh, that the ultimate thrust is why 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 talk about it? Um, Edward brought up the fact that uh, this helps ground so much of what we're doing politically. And the flip side of this too is I'm coming to Marx, and Edward also is coming to Marx from a perspective of being communists first. Like this is the this is about the political project for us and the concepts, conceptions, theoretical commitments we draft in. Those are going to have to justify themselves politically. And when answering the question, I think, even if not in a determinate way, at least getting a little clearer about why we're making the kinds of judgments we are, even if we're not like arguing like, and this is my great moral theory, um, helps us not just make better helps us not just to make the case for, for communism to, to people who aren't there, which is most of them, um, but also to, to sharpen, to even like provide the basic grounds of possibility for conversations about what we get after value, what we get with after stuff like generalized commodity production. Um, I, I think a lot of this, because there are a lot of hard questions and all the stuff which which used to be necessity seems to be sort of dropping away. Um, and we we can't talk about this determinately and nor should we. But if we talk, we need to talk about it at least a teensy bit because very often the people who are not really on board with me on the whole communism thing, but maybe are coming to it from the same place or with the same intuitions need to hear a little more about communism. And 
the the big thing, like big the questions about like power. It's a it's okay where what relationships are kind of. This is why people that again for the people in the chat who've been following the Twitter discourse of the past couple of days. This is why stuff like will restaurants exist under communism gets people so fired up. Can we or should we have answers to this? I mean, I'm not gonna. Th this is like cook shops of the future stuff, but articulating the grounds for our discussion apropos of the reasons we think generalized commodity production is bad, uh, opens up like communism in some ways as a program, as a terrain of discourse in a certain way for us. Can, can Go ahead. I just say something quickly? Uh, okay, so th thanks so much for, for, for your responses. Um, and uh, um, so I, I think I have two remarks. The, the, the first is that I, I think that it's a one very powerful argument to make uh, for uh, when we're confronted with people who, with apologists for capitalism is to, you know, one, one powerful argument for undermining the, uh, the, the, the idea of the, the market as a beneficial, um, coordinating coordinating mechanism is to ask the question that apologists of capitalism usually don't ask or evade which is why do people show up on the market in the first place in order to sell their labor power the, uh, in other words to, to point to the fact of market dependency that capitalism could only be established historically by creating market dependency by making a large part of the population dependent upon the market for their survival and when that condition was first created after that it has been um created elsewhere and reproduced and inherited by new generation of proletarians so uh, uh the the very existence of a market economy where the market plays this historically unique role as the mediating mechanism of the entire economic activity uh it that, that that situation is premised upon uh, uh, the existence of class domination, uh, and uh, and and that's what's what apologists of capital usually evade or or deny or don't talk about. Why do people? So they they just implicitly assume that uh, that economic actors always have an alternative to uh, showing up in the market, and 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 to go through the market in order to uh fulfill that to get what they want and the second thing i i wanted to say is that i i think that there might be a a, a potential in shifting our focus from um justice to freedom when we're talking about what's wrong with domination in, in instead of instead of discussing what kinds of power over would be okay and and what would and 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 how and I, because I, I I I completely agree that in a under communism we would also have to uh, make sure that certain tasks are done, for example, and that might involve some kind of power over, um, which would be a legitimate power. Um, but but I, I I think that in instead of perhaps perhaps one way to say it could perhaps be that the problem with capitalist domination is not so much that it's unjust but that it's uh creates unfreedom or is an enemy of freedom and so 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 if 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 you're interested in having more freedom or being free you should be interested in in abolishing capital um yeah Dad, just for just a footnote to what Soren just said, which would be, be to maybe add that one way to describe what's wrong with the capitalist form of domination is that it it's self-reproducing and 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 increasing in scale. It not only sustains the domination, but it, it augments that domination. Um, I just to go back a little bit, I think that both of your contributions, Cordelia and Edouard, I thought that you made a very persuasive case of why you have a collaborative project that is with a set of political goals that requires uh, a set of concepts and tools 
that you find domination to be a very useful concept in that. And I, I'm, I'm convinced by that on the one hand. I guess on the other hand, what I might say is that if that's the repertoire you want to move toward, I think the thing I would be concerned about, and there were a set of comments in the, in the YouTube comments, there were a set of comments from Jack, um, who I think, although uh, they evidently haven't finished high school yet, has given a better answer than I can give, which I think goes back to something you said at the beginning, Cordelia, which was response to liberals, which we could mean just to be political centrist that you are in deliberation and negotiation and dialogue with. But if we also mean it in a somewhat more substantive sense that they actually have a liberal conception of society, I mean, for me, that's the problem. If, if we're operating on the terms of a conception of a social order that is the liberal conception, we have to challenge that first because that's the wrong conception. We don't live in states of nature where we're free, equal, and autonomous and contract one another to only have power ruled over us when it's consensual. And that is a framework that has historically, I'm not saying there's not alternative trajectories, but that is the framework that has historically given rise to conceptual work on power and domination. You working with Luke's, so there's a Habermasian tradition. Um, but, but the problem there is always that there is an implicit horizon in which we will have only horizontal power relations. We will have none that are vertical. And the normative judgment is between the domination we're dealing with now and that purported alternative. Now, for me at least, and, and you, uh, Jack pointed in the comments to a theory tradition and Bersani um, as rejecting that entire liberal framework where we live in relations of violence. Uh, I've drawn on that in the past, but in more recently, and I think more productively polemically is Ranciere's conception. We don't live in democratic regimes. We live in orders of oligarchic power. We live under vertical power relations all the time. Now in that framework, what domination means is going to be much harder to come by. I mean, I think there's a, there's a Foucauldian line about power relations flowing everywhere and in both directions, but relations of domination occurring when those power relations crystallize or solidify or become rigidified. And it's in that context that I footnoted Soren's last comment, which is to say that the nature of power relations through the wage labor relation under capitalism is one that is constantly rigidifying itself. It is giving rise to itself over and over again because the nature of a monetary economy is continually forcing the worker who has to sell labor power for a wage to again sell labor power for a wage. And that might be a space where if I was trying to do conceptual work here, that looks like something like a Foucauldian conception of domination. And for me, it would be really important that it's not a Habermasian or Luxian conception of domination, because however much that language is necessary, if you draw it from those sources, it's going to be contaminated by that liberal framework. And, and that's deeply problematic, I think. So that might be a, a way of a, a trajectory to think that in. And I do think we lack, um, I mean, this would be also my, I, I think that, that Will Roberts' book, I'm among a chorus of enormous numbers of people who think that that is a brilliant and amazing and illuminating work. I am much, much more appreciative of the reading of Capital Volume One than I am to the turn to Pettit later on. And that's because while Will would, of course, argue that the Republican tradition that he wants to invoke is a non-liberal one, I am not convinced. Um, and so I think that like that turn to, I think that the two halves don't fit together because of that. Um, which means I think there is a space for work like what you're articulating, Cordelia, but that maybe drew on, on some different resources and maybe linked it back to Marx more directly, um, which is where my, you know, my one thought here is, is the way in which the relation of capitalist domination in the wage labor relation is self-replicating, rigidifying. That to me is something that I would wanna be able to call domination in this loosely Foucauldian sense, because this concept I think comes from like an interview in Foucault, it's not like we have Foucault's book on domination, um, but that's where I might head. Ah, sorry, I thought Edward was speaking next. Um, let's see, so uh, a couple points. Um, I thought the, the the mute compulsion quote, like you, 
the, the focus on the way in which generalized commodity production makes you enter the marketplace if you don't want to be hungry, for instance, um, I thought was was really, really solid. I, I, I wish I saw more people draw attention to this in the literature because um, there's a it, it's strongly compulsory in this particular sense. Um, but I guess the thing I find kind of interesting about it is that when we're trying to figure out uh, the power we're okay with, the power we're not okay with. Um, and, and you know, it, it's an open question to what extent, how determinate we have to be about this. Um, I think that the focus on you have to enter the marketplace, you have to sell your, you have to uh, like, you either have to, you're proletarianized or you're in a relationship of dependence uh, or, you know, as, as Sam suggests in capitalist economics, you can also choose to be born rich. Um, <laughs> these are kind of your options. This is really interesting. And I think maybe you could draw this out. You could use this to kind of furnish an account of a particular sort of compulsion we're not okay with. Maybe one where the it, it's power and uh, what I'm doing is, it's not just like power over in general, but it's power over and the, the kind of penalty I'm imposing for you're not complying would be something like withholding a basic need or however we want to draw it. Uh, I, I want to say uh, the, the way it gets framed in, uh, in your book is, is you know, um, conditions, social and material conditions of existence. Um, and so this, this, I think, does provide us with kind of an escape hatch. But the question is to what extent we can use this escape hatch without finding ourselves in a kind, in a, maybe in a week, but in a particular kind of naturalism. Um, and whether this is in fact, either whether uh, this puts everything we want on the right side of this, because um, I think you could find cases where, for instance, like necessity under communism, um, it, you can't really opt out in this tidy way either. Um, and I think you also wind up with cases where we want to bar certain kinds of power, power over, which uh, aren't just in social and material conditions of reproduction, aren't just in maybe the kind of like fragmentary sketch of, of uh, natural needs as kind of a minimum without, without like taking natural needs to be true needs or what have you. Um, and then apropos of uh, something Sam said briefly, um, I, I completely agree in terms of, of finding a lot of this to be kind of uh, tied up in liberalism conceptually in, in a kind of tricky way. Uh, and I, I, I often find that like freedom in general uh, is kind of something, our concept of autonomy, uh, I would probably argue that like the turn to autonomy in like German idealist political thought in large part is, is kind of an opportunistic reappropriation. Uh, pe people moving to, uh, you know, like Osarkeia as, as being self-standing uh, as a way of uh, justifying like Fichte does uh, the existence of property relations. And so this is kind of like, like a, a direction I feel kind of iffy about. Um, and usually I, 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 I want to see this thicker conception maybe of, of freedom or this thicker conception of anti-power or what have you, if it's being used so we can make sure that it can't go down any of these liberal routes. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm basically in agreement with the thrust of that. Uh, I, I thought it was really insightful. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add, Edward. Um, not really. I mean, I, I just looking at the time, I don't want to, to really go over and if there's people in the comments that want to monopoly on the, um, Are there any if you pivot at any point, I would like to, to just know. Yeah, just, uh, just uh, on that. I mean, I, I, I think you've pretty much said a lot in, uh, about that and I, I'm pretty much satisfied with what you said, but just to, to pivot a little bit. Um, I would say uh, if there's anything we can we can say about the forthcoming work. So so Soren, like um, I, I what I was referring to basically is is your dissertation, which is available, you know. And uh, I'm hoping that you when when you publish the book that it's not a totally different book, and you know, and then it's like oh, so this this is a uh, wildly different. So if there's any anything differences or substantial developments, uh, I would I would 
I'd be curious if there was anything there that when in revisiting it, if you, you changed, did anything change form uh, in an important way? And then Sam, your, the work on money. I mean, uh, uh, that's, that's super exciting. Um, I, I was, you know, skimming through capitalist economics this morning, just to kind of uh, sort of as a refresher and get the, get that out of the way. And um, I, I think that's one of the, 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 the really you know strong points. I mean, uh, it's sort of like a good primer on like a monetary theory of value sort of in a sense, but the, uh, or with like a sort of a Keynesian uh, bent it to a point. Um, I just finished the Zachary Carter book that you cite a lot. So like that felt very like, oh yeah, this is, I'm, I'm living in that book again. Um, uh, I guess one thing though, I would be curious on, and I, I would be curious on your answer to, because again, sort of pushing on, on what you said about value in that one lecture, which you don't even really say to that quite that extent in 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 the book in uh there's no such thing um that one you sort of uh, you, you leave aside you mostly said it in the lecture you sort of kind of sidestep a lot of questions of value in capitalist economics um for the most part you kind of say you know value is representation of money or claim on money or, or uh, money's a representation of value and a claim on value or something but you mostly sidestep a theories of value would you be visiting that at all in the book on money um just to kind of sort of tease out what that would look like or if that's spoiling too much to be to be determined. Um, but otherwise, um, thanks just for having me and we can turn over to the YouTube comments and stuff at any time. I, I too want to hear the questions about the forthcoming book answered if you have a second. I'll, I'll just say really briefly. Um, so one is that there was a comment uh, from the YouTube thread from uh, username Marxism.ism about uh, how do we consider a framework of non-domination outside of the Republican liberal tradition? I'm not sure Marx himself did. And, and I don't have an answer to that question, but just to underscore, I think that's the right question. Like, I don't think, I don't think that's in Marx. I think that there is a space in a particular reading of Marx and, and a stronger critique of a liberal theory of society to build that. Um, but I don't think that it's been built. I think my, my work on the social formation, I might think would be one of many things that could contribute to that, but I think it would have to link up with other things. And I, and I suppose in this case, for me, it's just a kind of aversion to a sort of domination in my own field of liberal Habermasian, Rawlsian. I mean, to engage with that, with that normative framework is to entangle oneself in things I've, I've been trying to create a gap from, but maybe I've created a gap. So there's a space for others, which would be, which would be wonderful. But, you know, for me, I've even taken to, there's a, there's a trend by, um, junior academics who are doing political theory work uh, that everyone describes themselves now as a normative political theorist. And this is, my graduate students know this has been a pet peeve of mine that like, we should be theorizing the world, not doing this thing which positive social scientists confine us to, which is saying uh, we can make judgments about the world. And what I hear Cordelia and Edouard describing is not that project at all, right? This is a rich political engagement that is dealing with conceptual terminology that helps to describe that world that we are engaging with. So I think that's really important, uh, but but I don't have the answer yet. Um, briefly on the money book. Um, well, I guess I should also say, Edward, because I never really responded to the question about, you know, in that lecture, you heard a kind of articulation of a conception of value that's transhistorical. And I guess what I would say there is on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a Foucauldian and I don't think anything is transhistorical. And my goal is almost always in, in scholarly work to denaturalize anything I can denaturalize. Um, so I certainly don't think that there is a, such a thing as transhistorical value. Now, that having been said, I think it's hard to grasp what it would mean to imagine a social order in the past or in the future and not think that there were groups and individuals within that social order who did something like what we call valuing. Um, now, I don't wanna make that there's value and it transcends all time and space. I don't think that's it. And the thing that they might do, for example, the horizon of a communist social order, there could be a valuing structure that we find unrecognizable today, uh, which I guess is the other thing about, my, about the work on, on value and the work on transformation, which is that I don't think that under, and this is simplifying of course, but under the terms of a feudal social order, anyone imagine or intended to carry out the creation of the structures that make up capitalism. It, I don't think that's how, this is what I get from Marx's 1857 introduction, that changes are, un, you cannot anticipate them, you can only understand them post hoc. I don't think that there were feudal lords saying, I want to become a capitalist. Lords and serfs disappeared as categories over a certain period of time and were replaced by capitalists and proletarians. What would be the subject positions of a post-capitalist or a communist social order? 
I don't know. And I think if someone says they know, then they're misunderstanding historical change. But will there be some sort of valuing scheme? Probably nominally, yes. But could it be so radically different from ours that it would be incommensurable? I, I think so. And, and, and I guess I also want to say I kind of hope so. I, I just wanted to say briefly, um, I, I, I so appreciate the, the genealogical denaturalizing aspect going on in your work. And, and I, I almost would connect this uh, maybe to, to Edward and, and, and my uh, slight suspicion, maybe one uh, shared to a certain extent with you with certain conce thick conceptions of, of freedom and autonomy. Uh, this, I'm just tossing this off to be, to be provocative, but speaking of people who do genealogy uh, in, a, in a kind of wacky off the cuff way, um, there's this remark in, in Pashukanas, uh, which, which really stuck with me and was like, wow, someone should write a bonkers intellectual history of this. Where, where Pashukanas is like, well, um, you know, suddenly it used to be no one, no one thought about political theory. Uh, no one thought that people had particular rights. No one had particular uh, freedoms owed to them. And suddenly we get these all of a sudden in Europe at a very particular place in time. He's like, what's up with that? He's like, he, he's like, well, maybe it just so happens that one of the requirements for generalized commodity, for generalized commodity production to, to be coherent, uh, to take place, um, is uh, a particular uh, conception of the juridical and moral subject that didn't exist before. Um, we've got to have th th this conception of equ nominal equality of the juridical and moral subject in, in liberalism for him, he says, is the kind of formal equality that enables the unequal exchange of equivalents that happens when I, the proletarian, uh, you know, sell my labor power. Um, and so I think this is really interesting. Uh, and I think if you, you pursued this, ang even just keeping this angle on the back burner for me, it is something I, I kind of think about sometimes when revisiting uh, political theory in a way maybe that doesn't come to it with thick conceptions of the subject or choiceability or freedom or autonomy. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add, Edward. If not, I can try to bring in a couple of questions from the chat if we still have another 15 minutes or so. Okay. Any questions anyone wanted to field? I think there was a particular question for Soren about uh, maybe it was mobilization for writing of the book. I don't know that he took that up. Um, Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's a bit, I find it a bit difficult to follow the, the comments while also listening to you. So I'm not sure I saw the question who asked it. Um, it's so. from Gouldhawk. Uh, if, you, if you scroll by time, it's around 1220. There's a couple questions there about um, why you wrote the book oh, yeah. and quote, quote from you there. I mean, okay, I want to so, talk about Star so, Trek and poker, but let's bracket that. <laughs> sorry, what did you say, uh, Sam? Sam was oh, sorry, I just about said the, the very last poker. comment was about Star Trek and poker. So we definitely want to fold that in at some point. But Soren should answer the much more intellectually substantive question. Okay, so, so it looks like there's a question uh, about a quote from my book, which is, this is what gives the capitalist class domination is distinctive in personal and abstract character and this is why it's misguided to equate class domination as such with personal relations of domination or to oppose it to abstract domination okay so that's a quote um, from my critique of uh, some value form theorists such as uh, Postone and also uh, Robert Kurz uh, uh, from the that critique tradition um, they often oppose class domination, the concept of class, class domination to the to abstract domination, or they often um, uh, assume that class domination is a personal form of domination. 
which I think is wrong because as I explained in my presentation, the one of the distinctive, one of the specific things about capitalist class domination is that proletarians are not tied to a specific capitalist, but are as a rule, uh, able to choose who they want to sell their labor power to. Um, so, um, and that's, and that's of course a consequence of the, um, the mediation between the, how, how the vertical class relations are mediated by the horizontal relations between the units of production. So because the units of production are, uh, um, split into private and independent producers who coordinate their uh, production through the, through market exchanges. Um, proletarians are not tied to a specific capitalist. So, and, and in that sense, um, capitalist class domination is an impersonal class domination. Um, and that's why I think it's misguided to oppose class domination to uh, abstract or impersonal domination as Postone does. And now I think we should uh, listen to what Sam has to say about uh, poker and Star Trek. I would like to hear that. I mean, I, I guess that speaks to the to the someone else also. I never I didn't really respond to the what the money book is doing, um, but I, it does sort of come out of the earlier projects in that Marx tells us that money is the necessary form of value if we take up a broadly conceived value form reading of Marx and therefore understanding of a capitalist social order, then we have to understand capitalism as this strange system in which commodities and money continually substitute for one another and seem to present themselves as value. Um, and I think that money has been I've done a, it, this is a more historical book. So there's a, a lot more on kind of the history of theories of money. And in some ways that's re recounting how bad they are because neoclassical economics as a paradigm settles on the commodity theory of money sometime in the early part of the 20th century, uh, particularly with Menger. And, and it's, well, shorthanding, it's just all nonsense. It's just, it's just not right in any way. Um, and Marx actually has, although Marx has been traditionally read as himself having a commodity theory of money, and there's a lot of very complex uh, passages that have to be teased out, particularly in volume one, uh, Marx's writings on money are really diverse. I don't think he had a coherent theory of money. I don't, I think he said things on money necessary to articulating his critique of political economy and his understanding of how capital works, um, but didn't develop a theory of money. And so he's inconsistent. But there are some earlier passages, particularly in the Urtext and the Grundrisse, that are deeply insightful about money as the necessary form of value. And I, I'm inspired by some of them, even though Marx doesn't have a big role to play in this book. The conception, the theory of money I end up developing is, is much more a credit theory of money, but it's inspired by Marx because it, it leads to this notion that I don't think everyone's anyone's ever really quite taken seriously, which is that under capitalism, we are we have this conception of exchange that for the neoclassical paradigm and for the classical political economy is the exchange of two commodities, one for another. They are of the same kind. They are both use values and exchange values, and we exchange them. But uh, under a monetary economy, we're actually exchanging a commodity for this weird credit debt implement. And they're two totally different things. And following Marx's understanding of capitalism is mysterious, I think this is even more mysterious, that we could, under capitalism, have developed a system in which we take a credit and swap it with no intrinsic value whatsoever and swap it for something of intrinsic value, a commodity. And I kind of have a, a redefinition of economic exchange under capitalism as the swapping of commodity for credit, which is the swapping of two very different kinds of things. And I use that to try to develop um, a theory of money that we can actually use to think about today's money markets. So the last few chapters of the books are actually uh, quite mechanical nuts and bolts, talking about the repo market and how it actually works, talking about the futures market and derivatives and the logic of the derivative. I think the logic of the derivative is, is a logic of the value form. And there's a space where kind of high finance and, and, and marks meet. So that's, that's what the book is sort of doing quite broadly. Um, but, but there's a lot of work to do, I found, in in trying to get right some sort of theory of money because there's a there's a lot of, of layers of obfuscation out there. And unlike other 
things that are hard to understand with money. I think we just all want to assume we do understand it because we use it every day. So it must not be that hard. But at least for me, it turned out to be one of the hardest things I've I've ever tried to understand. I tell I tell my students that like this is a kind of straightforward book on money, but but for me, money is harder than Hegel, and Hegel's as hard a philosopher as there could be. I, I have to say, uh, there, there was a recurring question uh, Edward and I kept asking each other, which was something like, you know, if you, if you listen to Heinrich and, and you come away with the impression that Marx is a monetary theory of value or that we, we can be justified in calling it, in the, calling it this in some sense. And obviously this goes back to Backhouse, et cetera. It's not his coinage. Um, the, the, the question is, uh, a question we asked was like, what would, what would, what would, what would happen after a uh, critique of political economy, uh, what would happen in the space opened by this monetary theory of value, and what would like an intro? What would an intro textbook look like in it? What would a research program in it look like? And so I was I was joking to to Edward that um, capitalist economics was kind of like someone wrote a monetary theory of value version of like Samuelson or Mencu, and a com as a compliment, uh, obviously. Um, so I just wanted to underscore, I really appreciated that that angle of it already. Thanks, yeah, I think that's, I mean, part of the reason why I, I kept moving more toward writing about money was the attempt to write the Capitalist Economics book, which was an effort to kind of start from scratch and write a book for general readers or students that didn't presume that you'd read Marx or classical political economy or had had an intro macro or macro course. And, and that was a hard, puzzle to solve and the way I, and I don't know if I have, but the way I tried was really in some ways to start with money. Uh, so I think it does kind of uh, exemplify Heinrich's thesis of, of capitalism as a monetary, um, understood through monetary value, because the way to, the way I start with explaining what capitalist economics is, is to start with money and continue to come back to it. Uh, and it was in trying to get it right there uh, that I ended up working more and more on money, but also trying to understand the world that we're in now, right? I mean, the, the crypto madness, um, stable coins, um, oil futures trading for negative $37 a barrel. Um, these things are, no one seems, when you read the simple explainers on them, they don't really explain. So having some tools to try to, to, try to get into that and to link it to, because we know it is centrally important to capitalism as a functioning social order in the broadest sense, uh, but money's so often been bracketed off. So I hope one of the things that this book does is um, let people make those connections, even if they don't want to get lost in the weed of derivatives, to feel like they're not just because what sometimes happens on the political left is we just say, you know, that it's all Ponzi schemes and capitalist schemers. And there's a truth to that, but it doesn't actually capture the depth of the, you know, the fact that the money markets are at the heart of how capitalism works today. All right, I think we have to just about wrap it up for time, but I just wanted to, to thank you both again today for being here and to, to encourage, urge, uh, compel the audience to, to go and, and buy your books. Um, Mute Compulsion, I believe is available, it will be soon in at least three languages. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty hefty stack for, for the book collectors at home. Um, and, uh, the Sam's Sam's work uh, is on such a dynamic range of topics. Yeah, no such thing as the economy is free on punctum. Uh, even if you think you know about capitalist economics, uh, capitalist economics and Oxford University Press, um, I, I think it would totally be worth taking a look at because uh, the the presentation is is so crisp and I think will certainly shape how I make many of these arguments, make these points of clarification to the people I talk to in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and I wanted to thank you both again for your time. Uh, and I think uh, that that's, that's about it, unless anyone else had any closing remarks, uh, we can pass it off to the moderators. What about your, your book, Cordelia? Thank you all. Uh, so um, my book will, will hopefully, I, I, it was initially gonna be done at the end of this year, uh, and hopefully will be out in 2023. Um, I, I had a kind of big health scare this year that pushed it back a ways, but I, I will keep everyone posted on that um, and a couple of short articles coming out soon, hopefully, 
touching on some sort of related issues and in, in mostly in social epistemology. Great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all so much. You. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, that was a really wonderful panel. Um, just real quick before we sign off, I wanted to let you all know that we have one more event for the month of May, and that is going to be tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Um, the Spectre Journal presents Ukraine, imperialism, and the world economy. Uh, and then lastly, if you like what you hear and you can are interested in supporting our work, you can do so through uh, the links in the description box below. We have a GoFundMe for one-time donations, and we also have a Patreon for um, sustaining um, uh, donations. And through our Patreon, you can also listen to our uh, podcast that produces content year-round called Cinderblock. Um, thanks again to all the panelists and for everyone watching. Um, uh, we are going to sign off now, and I hope to see you all tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Goodbye. <laughs>